The title of my presentation is Sunlight and Health Update 2021. Facts about UV radiation, vitamin D and the importance of a full spectrum. Let me start right away. The first part of my presentation covers some facts with regard to sunlight and vitamin D. The characteristic of sunlight is the blueprint for life-friendly light. All living beings are adapted to this kind of light and have been since billions of years. If sunlight does not promote health but harms it, the reason is mostly that we handle sunlight incorrectly. The solar spectrum consists of visible and invisible parts. The visible spectrum of sunlight varies between red and blue, depending on season, elevation angle of the sun and distance from the equator. The invisible near-infrared is always present day and night, while the short wavelength UVB is only present when your shadow is shorter than your height, as a rule of thumb. This means for Germany that relevant portions of UVB are present only between April and September and only between 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. UVB is the only radiation component of sunlight capable of producing the sun hormone vitamin D in our skin. Due to our modern lifestyle, most people in industrialized countries suffer from a more or less pronounced vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency is widespread in the population, is associated with most diseases of civilization and can be eliminated by sunlight or by supplements. 20 minutes of sunbathing may result in the photosynthesis of 20,000 international units vitamin D, but only if one is almost naked and the heliotherapy is conducted during a time of the year when there is enough UVB radiation available, which is the case, for example, in summertime during noontime. Of course, this also depends on the current weather conditions. Due to their living conditions, many people can therefore only rarely use sunlight for the formation of vitamin D in a meaningful way. This raises the question if whether it doesn't matter to correct a vitamin D deficiency by using sunlight or by taking vitamin D supplements. Oral application of vitamin D is sunlight independent independent from UV and available all year round. A drawback is the individual metabolism so that regular blood tests are required to grant for the optimal blood levels. Orally ingested vitamin D is distributed via fat transporters and has a shorter half-life. In contrast, vitamin D, which has been photosynthesized in the skin, is sunlight dependent and especially depends on the presence of UVB. It is only available in summer, but we can see here an automatic dose regulation, so no blood tests are required. It is distributed via a specific transport protein, D-binding protein, and shows a longer storage time in the organism. When ingested orally, vitamin D is mainly attached to lipoproteins. These are non-specific transport proteins, but transport all kinds of lipophilic molecules. They do not bind vitamin D specifically and therefore cannot transport it to the target sites in the same way as the specific binding protein does. We learn more about the possible consequences of different transport routes. Here, we could call the lipoprotein transport route the unaddressed mail with no specific delivery where the product does not arrive safely where it's needed. In contrast, the D-binding protein provides the registered mail with preferred transport. In this case, the product arrives safely to the addressee. 
In reality, of course, the matter is even more complicated, but there are, for example, different variants of the D-binding protein in the genetic pool of the world's population, and so on. In any case, the D-binding protein holds the vitamin D molecule much more tightly than the lipoprotein. It acts like a strong magnet, so to speak. In the skin, this property serves the purpose of pulling the vitamin D3 into the epidermis, from the epidermis through the basal membrane into the bloodstream. This is a kind of one-way street, so that once the vitamin D molecule is coupled to the binding protein, it can no longer return into the skin. However, instead of continuing to dissect the effects of sunlight and reducing them to single actions, I would like to take this opportunity to show you the therapeutic potential that lies in the targeted application of sunlight. Some of the following illustrations are over 100 years old and date from a time when antibiotics were not yet available to doctors. Niels Rüberg Finsen. This is the man who started to investigate the effects of sunlight scientifically in the late 19th century. His research brought him the Nobel Prize Award for Medicine and Physiology in 1903, mainly because he had discovered a method of treating the skin manifestation of tuberculosis, a disease called lupus vulgaris. His Phototherapy was better than surgical intervention or radiotherapy. It was the state-of-the-art treatment in these days. The next slide will show you how the treatment was performed. Nurses, Finsen called them light elves, used concentrated sunlight, which was focused via quartz lenses, onto the affected areas of the skin. Another stunning example for the effective treatment with sunlight comes from Switzerland. Here, in the high mountains, the most distinctive form of heliotherapy was developed under the decisive leadership of Auguste Rollier. Rollier knew how to apply sunlight in a masterly way, not only in the field of therapy, but also in that of prophylaxis and hygiene. Please note the head protection, which is clearly visible in the two examples on the right. These illustrations show an orphan boy with a severe form of multiple superinfected tuberculosis. The four and a half year old patient was prone to death when he came to Rollier's hospital. One can see here the picture of advanced tuberculosis of both feet and the right hand, plus severe left pulmonary tuberculosis with peritonitis and marked cachexia. After only six months of regular heliotherapy, a completely different picture emerges. The same boy has apparently recovered from his severe illness and is in an extremely gratifying state of health and nourishment. The follow-up images after 2.5 years and after 15 and 23 years vividly show how sustainably heliotherapy was practiced in the Swiss mountains by the most famous European sun doctor, Auguste Rollier. By the way, he was always convinced that it was not only the UV component or other individual spectral ranges in sunlight that were responsible for his therapeutic successes, but sunlight in its wholeness and totality. Seeing such convincing healing results, it is natural to ask whether sunlight and vitamin D might not also be helpful 
in fighting the current COVID-19 pandemic. The paramount question in this second part of my presentation is, can vitamin D serve as a beneficial intervention in COVID-19? Vitamin D is not only responsible for calcium balance and bone health, but also has a multifaceted influence on our immune system. It is considered an immune modulator and promotes the formation of cathelicidins, which are responsible for non-specific immune responses. Cathelicidin LL37, for example, is able to block the spikes of the coronavirus and hide the receptor sites where the virus wants to dock. So you could say flippantly, if we normalize vitamin D levels and avoid a deficit, that's certainly good against corona. But that's not how science or evidence-based medicine works. The topic is extremely controversial. As always in evidence-based medicine, it takes a very long time before a watertight proof can be provided by means of scientific studies. Nonetheless, there are sources of information that do a good job of providing a neutral assessment and presentation of the study situation. I would like to highlight one such source here, namely the website vdmeta.com. Independent scientists, free of conflicts of interests, have joined forces on this internet platform. They want to update published studies on COVID-19 and vitamin D in real time and offer a real treasure trove. This is an image of the homepage of vdmeta.com. Here you can get a good overview of existing current studies. The very first item in this list speaks for itself. 96% of 25 vitamin D treatment studies report positive effects. The studies consider three different modalities of application namely prophylactic application of vitamin D prior to exposure to the virus, further the effects of application in an early stage of infection, as well as treatment with vitamin D in an advanced stage of the disease. This already shows that the application of sunlight is suitable at most in the context of prophylaxis, whereas in the case of disease, only supplementation can be considered. In this graph, each bar corresponds to a study under consideration, with a green bar corresponding to a reduction in the corresponding risk of disease, and a red bar for an increase in risk. We can see that only one study found an increase in risk of 50%, with the negative effect observed at a very late stage of the disease using cholecalciferol. The reason might be, in late stage treatment, the administration of calcitriol, which is the active hormone, shows greater improvement compared to cholecalciferol, which must first be converted into the active hormone. So, this image may serve as a visual summary, 96% of the treatment studies could demonstrate a positive effect on the cause and outcome of the disease COVID-19. Despite all the controversial discussions about the importance of vitamin D, many physicians in Germany have come to the following conclusion. Pending further results from intervention trials, individual clinicians in Germany currently see more benefit than harm in vitamin D supplementation for inpatients with COVID-19 and believe it is unethical to withhold this from patients. They also recommend vitamin D supplementation to outpatients. 
Advisory institutions in other European countries also make clear recommendations for regular vitamin D supplementation in different doses, especially in light of the pandemic. Now is the time for an important disclaimer. While many treatments have some level of efficacy, they do not replace vaccines and other measures to avoid infection. Finally, I come to the third and last part of my presentation, the importance of a full spectrum. This figure shows all the spectral ranges of sunlight and relates them to specific biological effects. Here we can also see examples for spectral opponency, which is the term for complementary effects of certain spectral ranges, for example blue versus red, UVA versus infrared A. There are also synergistic effects of certain spectral ranges existing, for example on blood circulation. UV radiation acts mainly on the epidermis, but does not reach the deeper layers of the skin. Deeper layers carry the blood and are of paramount importance for healthy skin and a healthy look. The total skin reflectance results from two separate mechanisms. The epidermis contains melanin only, which results in a grayscale value. The dermis contains blood and hemoglobin as the paramount chromophore, which provides the red scale value. Gray and red combine to brown in the eye of the observer. Natural and healthy looking skin tone always is a combination of red and gray values. Imbalances, which means too much gray or too much red, signal unnatural and unhealthy skin conditions for example in case of erythema. UV and red light not only have different penetration depths, but also different effects in the tissue. Let's compare the stuff with a tree. The root, roots nourish the leaves and vice versa. Both parts are needed. The leaves resemble the epidermis and are reached by UV only. The roots resemble the dermis and can only be reached with longer wavelengths, red and near-infrared. For healthy skin functions, including vitamin D production, both wavelength ranges are needed. UV is mainly responsible for stimulating certain processes, while red and near-infrared light are responsible for nourishment and regeneration. May I introduce to you the molecule species which, is, which are responsible for many, many of the light effects, especially with regard to ultraviolet. Free radicals, or so-called reactive oxygen species, ROS. These molecules have different tasks, for example as doorkeepers, responsible for first-line defense, the destruction of bacteria, bacteria, fungi and viruses, Practically all dermal light reactions, except the vitamin D photosynthesis, depend on the generation of ROS, such as photoadaptation, horny layer production, and last but not least, tanning. Free radicals, they can be helpful or harmful and dangerous. If the concentration gets too high, they turn into radical hooligans. Do you have any idea what helps against these hooligans? What keeps them in the right concentration window? Right. Antioxidants. We need ROS, but we have to control them. It's all about the optimal blend. Desired effects of the short wavelength part of the spectrum are hormone production, cell production via skin thickening, photo prevention, and stimulation of pigment production. If the concentration gets too high, cellular stress prevails and we need antioxidants. This is exactly what the other side of the spectrum can offer. Red and near-infrared light features cellular regeneration and repair. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate which is the energy correlate, the fuel for cells. 
AOX stands for antioxidants. They are produced in the second phase of red light irradiation. This study could demonstrate that non-coherent near-infrared radiation protects human fibroblasts from solar ultraviolet toxicity. If you protect fibroblasts, this will result, for example, in better collagen production after the treatment with UV. Here we see a thigh irradiation with UV light, where different dosages were applied. On the left side, the UV irradiation obviously led to a significantly lower skin reaction. In this example, the so-called erythema threshold was changed by a previous irradiation of the right side with red light in such a way that the tolerated the UV light better. Of course, it is the left side, not the right side, pre-irradiation on the left side. Another study demonstrated that red light triggers an additional antioxidant production pathway. Actually, the third example showing the importance of the longer wavelengths. So, what is the relevance of this last chapter of my presentation? The title was The Importance of a Full Spectrum. If you are using sunlight, you don't have to think about the full spectrum since it's automatically provided. But if sunlight is not available and you choose to use artificial UV light, keep in mind that there is a lot of evidence from the past and even more from the present that a combined use of both ends of the spectrum creates conditions that are closer to nature and in many ways enable the organism to respond better to treatment, be it for cosmetic purposes or for vitamin D production. I do hope this was the right dose of science faction, not too much to bother you, but enough for your better understanding. Thank you very much.